Polo Sur. Sabes, Herb, nunca compartes tus sentimientos conmigo. Es verdad. Muy bien. Hoy siento frío. Siento que deberíamos ver a Big Man. Siento que eso nos animaría. Me alegra haber tenido esa charla. Es agradable compartir cosas. Es algo maravilloso. ¿Me das una de tus anchoas? Olvídalo, amigo. Mm. He hecho, su cerebro es capaz de almacenar más de 100 mil millones de bits de información. Eso es igual a tener cinco grandes enciclopedias. <risa> Vaya, es increíble. Soy Big Man y ustedes están viendo el mundo de Big Man. ¡Big Man! Estelarizado por Paul Salum. Welcome, guys, to an all new episode of Insights. I hope that by now is your favorite scientific talk show. And I'm so very honored to present uh, today's guest, Mr. Paul Saloum, who since 1977, sorry, has been a puppeteer, performance artist, actor, and filmmaker. Paul Saloum has written, designed, and performed 15 stage shows, including Fruit of Saloum, The Illuminations, and White Like Me, a Hunky Dory puppet show. He has employed many forms of puppetry in his work, marionettes, found objects, toy theater, overhead projections, uh, cantestoria, ventriloquism, and shadow hand and rod puppets. Uh, he's been awarded a Village Voice OBIE, uh, an American Theater Wind Design Award, New York Dance uh, Performance Award and four uh, UNIMA Citations of Excellence in the Art of Puppetry. He has uh, co-written, co-produced and performed in a toy theater uh, feature film, Dante's Inferno, based on paintings by Sandu Burke. The Museum of Modern Art acquired the film in 2013 for its permanent collection. He is also known as a wild and woolly scientist Big Man on TV's Emmy-winning educational classic Big Man's World. Saloon tours two stage shows, Big Man on the Brain and Big Man Live, throughout North and South America. Uh, currently, Paul and Lim, Lynn Jeffries sorry, are creating Santa Controls the World, a series of short comedic films employing Kish, Santa Claus, Snowman, Elf, and Nutcracker figures from the 50s and 60s, and addressing, and addressing rampant consumerism, constant surveillance, the war on Christmas, stand your ground shootings, climate change, and plenty of other jolly subjects. I will leave you the, uh, the link for this project on the description of the interview. So, uh, Paul, I, I hope I don't come off as a groupie, but I'm so thrilled to have you here. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Um, I should I should correct my own press release because uh, I've been doing the solo puppet work since 77, but I joined the Bread and Puppet Theater when I was 19 in uh, 71. So okay. it's, my, it's my 50th year working with Bread and Puppet Theater and uh, working as a puppeteer. So I, uh, I need to adjust my press release so that it's accurate. Oh. Well, then uh, we have to add uh, six more years to the career in, in puppetry. Indeed. Sorry. Paul, uh, well, I, I have mentioned uh, a little bit of your uh, career uh, in the form of a bio sketch, but I would love if you could tell us a little bit more about your background as a puppeteer and as a filmmaker, which is maybe uh, another uh face of your professional career that uh maybe not all the people are familiarized with especially in in, in latin america well i uh i was in college in 71 i went to hippie college um uh where there were no grades no academic requirements uh 
it was the most hippie, most wild, most free college in American history. And it suited me fine because I was sick of school. And um, the Bread and Puppet Theater, which is kind of a neo-German expressionist, uh, radical artist puppet theater was in residence at the school. And I took some workshops and I fell in with them and I still work there every summer. Um, okay. And it's been a long, crazy ride. And that, that very blessed and fortunate thing of being with Bread and Puppet Theater led me to puppetry. Okay. Um, and then I started doing the solo shows in 77 and I've made 15, I put in the press release, 15 different programs, but actually I have no idea how many. I mean, I, I should go and count them up, but I think 15 is about right. Um, and uh, they're very political, social, and mainly comedic. I mean, that's my thing is comedy. Um, and along the way, made a couple of puppet films. And I also got the Beekman job and did that for a number of years and moved out to California yeah. to do that. So I've had a I've had an interesting ride. I've done a lot of different things, and I I feel pretty lucky. Yeah, sounds sounds like a very uh, well not only intense and, and, and interesting career, but also very diverse in terms of, of very different kinds of works, right? And very different kinds of uh, approximations to the work. I mean, from filmmaking, directing, producing, acting. It's quite interesting. Yeah, there's been a lot of different, a lot of different media that I've worked in, um, like Canta Storia, which will be difficult to translate into Spanish. It's an Italian word, but it's storytelling with pictures. And it's a tradition that's existed in every culture, except American culture. And um, it basically, it's about telling stories using paintings or drawings. And back in the day when there was not much to do some joker like me would show up in a town somewhere in germany or japan and they'd have a series of paintings that they had made or one single painting and then they would sing or tell a story that's illustrated in the painting or illustrations and a lot of people at that time had never even seen a painting or a drawing so um yeah so in german it's called bankled song in um Japan, it's Itoki, uh, and it exists in many, many different traditions. So that's just one aspect of sort of performance, puppet-related performance that I was introduced to in the Bread and Puppet Theater, which led a revival of um, Canta Storia here in the, in the United States. Okay, I, I will definitely look it up because I... I had not heard the term before, well, until I read your bio and I, I, I made a very quick search, but uh, it definitely sounds like something very interesting and very like rooted in some cultures, right? Yeah, yeah, it's an old school thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, storytelling with pictures is also slideshows, PowerPoint, and for that matter, movies and TV. I mean, it's just pictures. Yes. And uh, they happen to be moving pictures, but it, uh, there's a book written about Contastoria that's called Film Before Film. Okay. So, you know, it, it's interesting. It's a precursor to film. I mean, most people who study film and make film have never heard of it and it would never occur to them that Contastoria is film before film. But yeah. Uh, yeah, storytelling with pictures, what we like to do, it's fun. Yeah, it sounds like it definitely. So Paul, since, uh, well, most of the content in my channel has to do with science communication. And uh, I don't know if, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that you are aware of that, that uh, Big Man's World having been and still is a very important uh, deal in Latin America. So if you don't mind, I would like to ask you some questions regarding that, because I'm sure that in the 90s, that was a different challenge uh, compared to now, right? That we have the internet, we have YouTube, and someone like me who has not a, not, not any idea of communication, but tries to make something about uh, its science work, well, I can do it, and that's uh, easy. But I don't think uh, in the 90s that was, uh, it was a pretty different situation, right? Um, yeah, 
Um, I mean, there had been science educational shows on TV. There weren't many for kids. There was a guy named Don Herbert, um, Mr. Wizard, and um, he was on when I was a kid. Hey. Um, and uh, but other than that, really, wasn't a lot of a lot of programming, educational programming for kids in the science field. There were a couple of history shows. So yeah, it was, it, and plus it had a very unique look. You know, the camera was tilted. We used yeah. ultra wide angle lenses. So everything is, it's just one step below a fish eye. So everything's kind of distorted. We'd be very close to the camera. <laughs> it was yeah, kind of yeah. scary. <laughs> um, but we, we also, we talked to the kids, like we made eye contact. And I think that's partially why the show was so successful, particularly in Latin America, because we were making that direct eye contact with the kids and children don't make a big difference between someone they see on TV and someone they see on the street. Uh, it's, it's all kind of in the same book for them. So, you know, we were able to create a really great kind of intimate relationship with children um, because of the way it was shot. Yeah, and actually had not think of that before, but it makes total sense because yes, I mean, in the show, uh, not only you, but all of the actors tended to have this uh, direct communication to the kids, which uh, I think made it very uh, like acceptable for the kids, right? Yeah, it sort of involves them and making eye contact. And we were, we were also very close to the cameras and we, we shot with two cameras and they both had wide angle lenses and they were actually touching. Okay. They were pushed together so they were touching. And instead of um, the way the way that we made it kinetic, the director, Jay Dubin, was we shifted from camera to camera. So if you watch the show, you'll see the characters will exit and then enter another frame. Yeah. So we made the dynamics. The cameras never moved for any of the episodes that Jay directed. He never zoomed in. He never did a boom shot a tracking shot, any of that. It was, the cameras were locked off. The the cameramen, you know, like fell asleep or read magazines. They had nothing to do except check, check focus once in a while. But so the cameras were static and the performers moved. And that was very unique in television. Yeah. It hadn't really been done, but it hasn't been done since. And it was very tricky. It was a hard thing to learn. I made spikes on the floor. Uh, spike is a theatrical term for a mark you put on the floor so you could find your your place. Yes. And but I couldn't look down because I'm this close to the camera. I can't look down like where am I? Where am I supposed to be? I couldn't do that. So I had to feel it with my feet. So I invented this system of splitting um, dowels and then taping them to the floor so my feet could feel where my mark was, where I was supposed to be. So yeah, it was, it was, uh, we had a great time. It was a lot of fun. I, I don't know if you can tell or not, but uh, it was a total ball. We had a great time. Yeah, I, I think so, because uh, I think the uh, ultimate product reflects some, some of these factors that you're just telling us, right? And especially maybe the, the chemistry between the people, which I'm assuming was great. And, and well, this kind of dynamics. Yeah, well, we did get along really great. The executive producer, Mark Waxman, told me when we started, he said, your mood, because you're the lead character in the show, your mood and your affect and the way you are is going to inform the mood in the entire stage. Yes. And I was like, really? That's weird. But I thought, okay, so I thought, it's easier to be in a jolly mood all the time. It's too hard being a pain in the ass and kind of a bitch. So I just decided to be jolly and we had a jolly set and everyone was happy. We laughed all day long. We kidded around. We got along great. I was very close to Mark Ritz, who plays uh, Lester, the guy in a rat suit. Yes. We came very, very close and uh, very dear friends. And I was close and tight with the three different women that played the, the three lab assistants. Yes. And the prop folks, I was close to them. They were great. And I didn't know the lighting folks so well, but you know, you make friendships on the set and 
it was great. We had a we had a really good time. And the costumer Betsy Potter was awesome, and Wayne White, who's a famous painter now, and puppeteer, and he he did the set design. And um, Bob Breen, he was the art director. I I don't remember the titles, but he he took the drawings and made the set, and he made an amazing set off that. Um, yeah. he's he's a very talented guy, and they all became friends, and I'm still in touch with many of them. And then Jay, the director, Jay Dewan, brilliant, because he not only knew science and he knew TV and he knew tech and he knew he knew everything about cameras and lighting, but he also had a great and sick sense of humor. He had a real New York, Brooklyn sense of humor. But so he had, he had all the perfect uh, attributes to be the director of the show. Yeah, definitely sounds like it. I mean, to to be able to integrate all of these areas that he. Uh, kind of, uh, well, was familiar with into creating this one great product. Yeah. And it was based on a, a comic strip that was in the newspapers that uh, Jock Church, the creator of Beekman, he made on the Mac, on the Macintosh. And right. then it was in the newspaper, three or 400 newspapers all over the country where kids would write in and ask questions and Beekman would answer the questions in the newspaper. So it was, it was the show was based on that. Okay, so, so the show, uh, well, uh, the project came uh, as a consequence of these uh, cartoons or these uh, comics that were in the, in, the, in the newspapers, right? Right, yeah. Okay, and uh, well, I remember that in the show, uh, kids wrote to, so, so that big men would answer this, uh, these questions. Uh, I must say, uh, when I was, uh, maybe I was like 10, I used to come home from school and uh, Big Man's World came out at uh, 4 p.m. So I would uh, hurry through supper so I could run and watch it. And I, I, I always wanted to send a letter. So yeah. of course I didn't know that there, those were reruns. So uh, it probably wouldn't have made a lot of difference to send by letter. But uh, well, I kind of now I'm asking some questions to, to Paul, okay. which is very similar. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, in the beginning, we had fake letters, but once the mail started coming, we used, we did use real letters okay. from, the, from the kids. Um, and the bin that I turn around on the show, there's a bin with letters that actually had real letters in it. And sometimes I would reach in and I would um, find out the phone numbers of these kids and I call them up during lunch or something. And just as, as a, a laugh and a joke. And that was really fun to call them. The parents would answer and I'd say, hi, it's Beekman. And they'd think I'm putting them on or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but I called, I remember I called one kid on um, Mott Street or Mulberry Street in New York. And he, uh, which is uh, Little Italy. I used to live in New York. And I thought, oh, I'll call this kid in the old neighborhood. And, and he'd say, thanks for calling, but I'm kind of busy right now. I got to go click. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, but definitely sounds like, uh, well, everything that you've told us, uh, like it was a great time to doing the, the film, the filming, uh, is it correct? It, well, we didn't, it wasn't film, it was videotape, um, okay. but it was given a film look. It was an electronic treatment that was brand new in the early 90s that okay. made video look like film. Okay. So, it had a filmic look. I I don't I I don't know if I could tell the difference. I'm, I don't know a lot about that, but uh, yeah, you know, I mean, back in the day, nobody made movies with video, you know, because video just looked like crap, and everyone was a snob, and they wanted to make movies with film. But the thing is, video. Jay used to always say, you know, tape is cheap. Tape is cheap. Let's shoot it again. Let's shoot it again. Film yeah. is not cheap. Film is really expensive. So it's uh, it was a great advantage that we were shooting in video. Okay. Oh, I see. Well, and uh, and I guess that uh, also what you've told us about the way the cameras were uh, like steady and in certain angle maybe helped to create that uh, that look. Right, and they were also dutched, like they're tilted like this. And it's in Hollywood. It's called dutching the camera, tilting the camera. Uh, after some cameraman whose name was Dutch, you know, back in the 30s or something. Okay. So, 
and the wide angle lens kind of distorting everything. Um, yeah. And, you know, the way that Jay looked at the frame, I mean, he looked at the frame like a picture and wanted to fill it like a painting. You know, he wanted to compose every shot. And um, that, you know, and, and the folks who did the lighting, they were great. They did a great job in terms of really looking at the frame and filling the set with light. Yeah. And I actually learned a lot about filmmaking. I wasn't trying to, but I did. Well, it's uh, I I think it's a nice side effect of of working there for uh, for some years and having chance to uh, well to get to know the crew, get to work with other people, etc. Right? Yeah, yeah, definitely learned a lot. And they would throw gel out, theatrical gel, um, which is that colored plastic you put in front of lights. And they'd throw it in the garbage. And I'd take it out of the garbage and I'd take it home. And now I have this huge collection of gel. So I haven't I haven't had to buy gel for the movies I'm making. I'm just using the stuff that I take out of the garbage. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Once the show ended, you have continued uh, to make some work in uh, science communication with the same character uh, that is Bigman, right? You've uh, toured with some live shows. How has this experience uh, been? Uh, what has been the reception? Well, I um, we start getting requests, the studio, Columbia Pictures Television, yeah. for me to do personal appearances. And, uh, and when I did a personal appearance, I needed to do some sort of demonstration or, you know, do something, not just stand around and look weird. <laughs> and so I, worked and invented things that were easy and portable that I could demonstrate science with. And then I decided to make a show and uh, I had a couple of different agents working with me and I played almost all of the 50 states in the United States. Um, I toured like crazy and did so for, I don't know, over 20 years. And it was a lot of fun. I played it like, I play in thousand seat houses or 1500 seat houses for kids who were bust in. So you bring these kids in from school and there'd be a thousand kids in there going nuts. And uh, the teachers are all like, shh, you know, shut up, don't talk in the theater, don't, you know, behave yourself, blah, blah, blah. And I'd come out and right away, I'd get them screaming on their feet and going crazy. And then if I needed them to shut up, I'd say, okay, pipe down, take it down, be quiet. And they would listen to me. And I love performing for kids. I mean, even though I've done puppetry all my life, all my professional life, I was not doing puppetry for children. I, I should have mentioned that because I, okay. I, I tend to forget that everyone thinks puppets is about kids. But bread and puppet theater, all my work, all that, that was all for adults. I, I never, never, I mean, almost never did shows for kids. Uh, so doing these big stage shows, the Beekman shows, it was like, how do I make kids laugh? What do they find funny? And it's different than adults. It's not necessarily something that I find funny, but to figure it out, it was really fun. And also to make sure they're paying attention because I'm on stage as a thousand kids in the audience. I'm blinded by the lights. I can't see them, but if you do this long enough, you can sense when they're bored. You can hear them moving in their seats a little bit more, a little more rustling. And you're constantly paying attention to that, particularly when you're doing a solo show. I'm talking nonstop for an hour. Yes. Um, and they, you know, they would pay attention. It was pretty great. I really, I really did love doing it. When I come to Latin America, the audience is very, there are very few children. It's mainly adults who saw the show when they were kids. So it's like a nostalgia thing for them. So the humor I play in Mexico and Brazil, it's much more adult humor. It's and it's there's political elements and, and all of that because I can get away with it. You know, I did a lot of Trump stuff when I was in Mexico, you know, just made fun yeah. of him the whole time because he's just such an idiot. Um, Yeah, so it's been great and it's fun. I love coming to Mexico and Brazil. Uh, Mexico is an amazing country, beautiful people, the warmest, most wonderful people and so kind to me. And I love I love coming to Mexico. I hope to be back at some point when this pandemic calms down. Yes. 
Yeah, definitely. And uh, well, I had the chance to to watch you live in, in Mexico. And I think also what made it not only that it was like a grown up uh, audience and well, of course, the like this nostalgia uh, and this uh, Well, there's excitement, no, for for, right. for for you, but also I remember that for the live uh, translation, they got the guy who who did the actual translation of the show. So I yeah. think that made uh, this euphoria even uh, more intense. Yeah, uh, Juan is uh, he's you know he's great and he uh, he loves doing the gigs and. Um, Yeah, it's it's fun working together. It's uh, interesting doing the timing, figuring out how we do the translation. Uh, of course, a lot of young people in Mexico speak English, and I need to slow down when I speak in English, which is hard for me because I speak fast. Okay. I'm from New York. We all we talk fast yeah. in New York. Um, but yeah, it's been uh, great work working with Juan. Yeah, uh, Paul. I would like to talk a little bit uh, more and uh, about science communication in general. So you've had this experience both on TV and on live shows. Uh, so what do you think are the traits of a good science communicator? You have told us that, well, uh, beginning with the, the audience, it's different to talk to adults than uh, to children. Uh, so what do you think makes a uh, science communicator uh, successful? Um, well, I can only talk from my own experience. Um, I wanted to make a new Beekman live show and I thought, what aspect of science do I find particularly interesting that I'd like to do a show about? And I, I thought, oh, brain science, you know, neuroscience is fascinating. And there's all kinds of interesting stories about the brain and how the brain works and So I did a bunch of research and my artistic partner, Lynn Jeffries, did a huge amount of research and I figured out ways to explain like how the brain works when you burn your hand on the stove. And I made a series of illustrations, drawings mm -hmm. of um, what happens when you put your hand on the stove. So my drawings weren't on the TV show in Beekman's world, but uh, it, we, you know, uh, Um, Wayne White did uh, the very primitive animations on the TV show. And so there was already kind of a tradition of using animation in the show. And so I just used these uh, drawings to illustrate the whole thing of messages going from the hand up the arm and the spinal cord, which part of the brain. So it was, you know, I guess communicating science is like communicating anything else. It really helps to be passionate about it, really interested in it, and then to find really fun and unusual and funny ways of exploring it. So I used, I did some toy theater in that show where I had little puppets. I did ventriloquism with a skull. I did the slides, I had video all of that stuff um, that, you know, I just wanted to make it entertaining, but at the same time, have the kids leave the theater and having a different understanding of what was going on in their life. So, I, you know, my own approach is I like humor. I like visuals. I like fast pacing. I like the idea of explaining things in a couple of different ways. Um, But the visuals are particularly important. Like I love working with uh, Keynote, which is the Apple version of PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. um, I I love using pictures to explain things, to tell jokes, to get people to laugh, and to get people to understand things. Whether I'm drawing it myself or I'm yeah. building it myself or whatever, it's a great medium. Love love doing the slideshows. Yeah. Well, and I think that uh, one. Uh thing that hugely impacts on uh, the reception of people is maybe putting it in a way that they can relate to, right? That, that uh, it's relatable to them because, uh, well, you cannot maybe say, uh, they wouldn't find as interesting if you talk about the non-relatable part of the science uh, facts. 
I don't know. If, I don't know if it, it made any sense. <laughs> I think I wasn't very clear. Yeah, no. It, it, the information needs to be accessible. Uh, the writers on Beekman's World they did they wrote an episode about um, the theory of relativity, Einstein's theory theory of relativity, and they you know it was six minutes on the air for six to twelve year old kids, and you know I wouldn't want to have to do that. I mean that's way too. But they did a great job, and I got to be Einstein on the show, and I played yeah. with a Jewish accent. I, and that was fun. They had the wig and the whole thing, and that was a blast. But it, to take that, the theory of relativity, and boil it down into six minutes, yeah. is you know is is pretty amazing. And they did an amazing job. The writers did a remarkable job on the show. Um, so that's the trick. How do you take something really complicated and then simplify it without distorting it or making it untrue? Yes, that's, it's very tricky, but that, it's also if you're really interested in it, it's really fun doing that because the whole process all is it's got to be fun because otherwise, what's the point? Of course, yes, because it's not just about the way uh, when you stand and start uh, saying it, but rather the whole research behind it and the whole uh, script writing, uh, how you're going to do it, uh, how you put it simple. Uh, and actually, you just mentioned what uh, what maybe is a good introduction to my next question, uh, which is that you don't want to make it untrue also. Right. So so what do you think are the, the challenges that uh, the most common or most uh, important challenges in, in science communication? Well, if if you're trying to distill something into simple, you know, go from complex to simple, it's very challenging to keep it accurate. And how you do that exactly, and what disclaimers you may you may have, mm -hmm. uh, that's a tricky part. And it's extremely important to me that all my shows are accurate because we get lied to enough in the world and yeah. in the media and everywhere. And, um, you, you know, we sure don't need me lying to people. There's enough of that going on. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's the trick. Complex into simple and yet remaining accurate. And you have to cut corners and sometimes you're making generalizations. But I, I think most of the time, I mean, maybe we made a couple of mistakes on the show, but we had a science advisor who was an, an award-winning science teacher and the writers were interested in science, very interested in science. So, you know, for the most part, the show is accurate. Yeah, and, and I believe that uh, as you write and do more research and write more shows, while well, you begin to form this uh, scientific uh, kind of uh, think processes and you learn to uh, to be better at filtering maybe uh, the information, etc. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it just the process of making many shows, live stage shows, and also movies and videos and that sort of thing, you, eventually you figure out ways of doing these things. And, you know, you see pictures in your head. I mean, yeah. I you know, it's the story of my life. I'm like hallucinating all the time. <laughs> and, you know, writing the script or doing on your feet, improvising on your feet, it's a lot of ways to create things. Um, I do improvise a lot in performance, uh, particularly when I'm doing the live Beekman shows because I get audience volunteers up there. I ask them questions, whether it be children or adults, they'll say things, I'll kid them about them, or it'll lead off into some other thing. So it's improvisation. And, um, and that creates a certain kind of spontaneity in the show and a goofiness that continues the kind of aesthetic that the show the tv show had you know what mm -hmm. i mean because i'm doing a live show i only have an hour to set up i can't travel with a set and all this other crap right. somehow i've got to i've got to make the people be with beekman on that stage in the way that they were with the kids which is like almost impossible because there i am on a bare stage but the way I do it is with the joking and the friendliness and the goofiness and doing science demos in kind of a funny, goofy way. And I think for the most part, people have a really good time at the shows. 
even though my voice is different, you know, Juan is translating, but uh, yeah. that's what I want to have happen. I want people to have that Beekman experience. Well, that's just wonderful. And and also, I, I think that it helps keeping like this updated, uh, maybe the jokes, uh, as you mentioned earlier, note, maybe some kind of Trump jokes every now and then, uh, as well as the uh the the scientific demonstration so it's 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 this familiar uh context right right i mean i had to do the trump stuff because trump was so insulting to mexico and it was extremely embarrassing for many americans yeah this was being said on our behalf so it was a way to show i guess to show folks we're not all like that up here and you know We were very embarrassed by the guy, hated the guy, still hate him. Um, a terrible man. Yes. Terrible, terrible guy. Or Hitler, you know, the guy's a nightmare. So yeah. I put that stuff in there. And, you know, maybe some people are big Trump fans. Well, tough luck. Too bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, one, one of the things that made me start like this uh, series of interviews was... Uh, Well, with the rise of the pandemic, I I started noting more and more how pseudoscience and quackery have a great impact in everyone's lives. Uh, people, uh, this pandemic uh, made evident the necessity for some mental health care, for some physical care. Uh, vaccination is what uh, very important right now. And so there are a lot of, uh, well, false opinions or false uh, information, uh, misinformation out there that might be uh, well forming some opinions on people that may not be so close to science or that may not know where to look for true information or... Uh, right. Yeah. So uh, what do you think is the role of the science communicator in this? How, how, what's the posture that one should take uh, regarding this kind of uh of well snake oil salesman or uh maybe just ignorance people i don't know you know one of the great characteristics of science and scientists you know scientists are not afraid to say i don't know yes we don't know that's the truth about a lot of things we don't know The charlatans, the bullshit artists, they know everything. They're never going to say, I don't know. But scientists will. You know, there, there was a lot of criticism of the Centers for Disease Control here in the United States, a government agency. And they said in the beginning, you don't need to wear a mask. Why yeah. did they say that? Because they needed the N95 masks for hospital workers. They didn't want people going out and buying these things. They needed the people who were in the hospital room to have access to the masks. And plus, they didn't know exactly how the virus was transmitted. Yes. Like, the, you know, the day when the cases started happening, they didn't know how it was transmitted. Then they realized, oh, okay, it's airborne. And then it, be, it was like, oh, and it can be very small particles. Then they started recommending that people wear masks. You know, it, sci people criticize the CDC. They criticize the government. They criticize scientists. You didn't know what you're doing. Well, yeah, more and more information is coming. And, you know, they didn't know everything from day one. Unlike the bullshit artists who know everything from day one because they're making it up or they're misreading stuff. You know, I watched Eric Clapton, his video on YouTube or whatever, and he had a bad reaction to the to the um, vaccination, um, the vaccine. And it's like, okay, you had a bad reaction. And I feel bad. That's too bad. He seems to be recovering. How does he then jump to the place where this has got to stop and vaccinations are bad? It's like it's illogical. If if you took me to Las Vegas and you gave me the odds on the on a vaccine, I would own Las Vegas in like an hour. It's just about odds, mathematical odds. You know what I mean? It's I didn't want to take the risk. I'm not ready to die. I'm not ready to have chronic illness. I, had, I got a flu shot yesterday, you know, it, it, yeah, sometimes people react and something bad happens, but for the most part, that's not the case. So 
you can see how frustrating it is for people in the science world who don't know everything, who are dealing with information that's changing or not so much changing, but evolving our understanding of things is constantly evolving as as more research happens as more symptoms show up as different um strains of the virus show up it's an ongoing process it's not a bunch of answers that are locked in a box and you know and that's it and people that's a hard thing to deal with that we don't know everything and the things that is things are changing so you know how we do it how we fight against that uh you know we i don't know we just try to tell the truth and and support the scientists and support the people on the front lines who are doing all the hard work yeah yeah that's uh, i i think that this kind of spaces are very important for people to i think that if people understood that science is is not like a static uh core of knowledge like uh, maybe some people think that uh, science is their textbook right that, that it will never change and well it's actually uh, every day changing every day uh, we're always making new discoveries and science per se should always be open to new discoveries unfortunately there are some uh, statements that appear to be more uh, ingrained in people's minds like uh, this uh, article or this paper uh, telling that vaccines uh, cost autism that was published on The Lancet and it's been retracted, but people seem to be focused on that, right? Right. But at the end of the day, all you have to do is look at the odds, look at the percentages, look at the math. Forget the science, just look at the math. Yes. It's nuts not to get the vaccine. It's totally nuts. I mean, you know, I use DEET, you know, it's a it's a chemical I spray on my body when I'm around ticks that carry Lyme disease back east, you know, okay. and yes. I, so I, I'd rather die of cancer than get Lyme disease. You know, I, I think DEET has been proved to be safe, but, you know, I don't want to get Lyme disease. There's 32 different diseases you can get for ticks. So I'm spraying that stuff all over me. I'm not happy about covering myself in chemicals, but I do not want to get Lyme disease. So, yeah. you know, the, you have choices to make. I don't want to, you know, who wants to get a shot? Nobody wants, I drove the magic mountain, waited on line. <laughs> you know, nobody wants to do this, but I don't want to croak. You know, I don't want to kick the bucket. Yes, of course. And in the end is uh, like this cost, uh, risk, cost, uh, balance, uh, which is the same if people look at uh, cancer treatment in a lot of things. And maybe uh, I really liked uh, what you said, the example about, well, think about those, those thoughts in maybe uh, your chances of, for winning in Vegas, right? Right. So, so maybe that's another thing uh, because people tend to be very, uh, or to think in a catastrophic ways when, when you're talking about negative odds, but maybe if you start, putting it in terms of positive odds, then, right. then maybe the, the reasoning may change a little. Yeah, I was reading this article about UFOs and, you know, the, the U.S. Navy, they filmed these un unidentified flying objects that were moving in such a way that we can't explain. And if you do the research, you will find that the odds of it being from an alien civilization are extremely low that it is much more likely that it could be one of a number of different phenomena. Now, we like to think it comes from aliens because that's really cool. Maybe they'll come visit us and they'll bring better toasters and refrigerators or, you know, we'll have flying cars or, you know, three eyes or something. But as much of a fantasy as aliens and alien life, I'm not saying there isn't life in the universe, but the closest star is 25 trillion miles away now they might find a shortcut you know an elevator or something uh sure again we don't you know a lot of things we don't know that that we have no idea of uh and that's fine but it all likelihood science can explain what those weird phenomena are yes and we're not doesn't mean we're close to the idea of alien life i mean that would be idiotic But again, it's just down to the odds, it's, you know, yeah. percentages, Las Vegas. 
Yes, of course. And, and looking at those thoughts uh, through the light of, of the current knowledge, which may change in the future, but it's not what we know now. So we have to interpret things, uh, reality in terms of the current uh, state of the art knowledge. Right, right. And that's why all of this the space, space exploration, exploration, like of the Voyager and stuff, finding out what's in the cosmos. I mean, it's mind blowing and it's so difficult to comprehend. The idea that there are billions of galaxies, of galaxies, billions of them, it's just crazy and beautiful and mind boggling. And, you know, that's science. So I, I've, I find myself incredibly fascinated by it. Everything, everything between the vastness of the universe and the tininess of the cells in, in our bodies is, you know, it's pretty interesting. Totally. Yeah, I totally agree. And maybe the, the communication of science might help people uh, learn about this. Uh, science is full of uh, of awe, of wonder, of uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that by sticking to scientific knowledge you should take the awesomeness or the coolness out of uh, everyday life or the magic or whatever. But science it is uh, in its own right uh, awesome and wonderful. Yeah, I mean the the reality of the things that we understand that we can grasp that's science fiction enough for me. I mean. It's yeah. not fiction, but it's, it has that excitement of, of you know, the unknown. And there's so much more to learn and so much more that we will learn and discover. So it's definitely a moving, breathing field. And that's great. Yes. So, Paul, uh, maybe I, I don't want to take a lot more of your time, but I would like to, if you could tell us a little bit about your current uh, projects or if you have uh, some upcoming projects, uh, maybe uh, well i don't know live shows uh, what 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 are you working on right now uh well i've been mainly making these movies with the santa claus figures they're about five minutes long and i want to take political issues like the uh great pacific garbage patch or the the fake war on christmas that the right wing talks about in the united states just take topics like that and make these films. And I'm just learning filmmaking. It was something to do in the pandemic um, because I haven't done a live show. Well, I did live shows this summer because we work outside in the Bread and Puppet. Yes. And um, so I did a turkey act with some puppet turkeys and I got to wear a cowboy hat, be out there and a couple of thousand people in the audience. And it was really fun. So we work outside, we do big pageants and, um, And I was also doing museum tours in the Bread and Puppets Museum, and that was really fun. And I'm writing a tour now and put together a database so a lot of different people can run these tours. Mm -hmm. um, and then working, I, I want to make another 10 or 15 of these Santa films. And then we have other ideas for puppet stuff to do. And at some point, maybe make some TikToks and, you know, so yeah, there's always a lot to do. I have a channel on uh, YouTube called Fruit of Zaloom. Okay. It's one word, Fruit of Zaloom, and the, the videos are there. So. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I'll make sure to leave the, the, the link in the description so people can go and check uh, what you're currently working on. And, and Paul, I, well, once again, I want to thank you so much for for you having taken this time to, to talk and a little bit about your work, uh, both in the field of science communication, but also as a puppeteer and as a filmmaker, and a little bit about your current projects. Great, and I want to show you a piece of Mexican pottery. <laughs> oh, great. The, Isn't that great? It's uh, like an octopus, right? Yeah, it's... Um, um, Ken Edwards, um, I forget what the region of Mexico where these are made, um, Palomar, this one's Palomar, it's, yeah, it's a, um, an octopus, and the back there's a fish, and uh, it's part of the great uh, Mexican culture, the amazing uh, yeah. 1950s, 1960s pottery that was made there, so 
I, I love Mexican culture and from, textiles and maybe that's from Puebla. I yeah. Um what's the name of the, the pottery town? I forgot. In um I'm blanking on it. Here's wow. another piece right here. There are there are uh, a few few towns that, that work with uh with oh that's great. Wow, that's that's amazing that you have a little bit of Mexico in your desk. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm okay. sure that it, uh, the more. audience will appreciate that a lot since since you are one very loved uh, person here in Mexico. Yeah, and I'm a big fan of uh, Orozco, particularly his his yeah. murals are amazing, and Rufino Tamayo and and uh, Posada and, you know, so many great Mexican artists, uh, Leonora uh, Carrington, yes. who's an expat and um, yeah, Mexican culture is amazing. And um, it's a great place and the food's unbelievable. And so I'm very blessed and very lucky that I've been able to come and hang out with you all. That, that's great. And I uh, feel so nice that people appreciate and uh, have uh, this, uh point of view of our culture which uh maybe uh, not a lot of people have the idea of, of all the diversity that that we have oh yeah definitely so paul well thanks thanks again uh, i had a great time thank and, you and hope you have a uh, hope you have a great uh weekend a great uh lot of luck with your projects and stay safe stay thanks safe. man thanks for having me bye bye bye